Hey guys, and welcome to our last session in Death and All of His Friends. We today are going to look at this expansive unfolding of the figure that we started with. Remember, our doctrine of sin began with a deceiver, this serpent that nudged Adam and Eve towards moral autonomy and joined us in the complicity of the fallout, the tragedy of sin. God is changing our nature. He is reteaching us how to walk and be and to live out as, a, as made in the image of God through Christ in a doctrine we call sanctification. Will he also then deal with the other part of sin? The one who nudged us, invited us into it. Will he deal with the serpent? Will he deal with Satan? Well, that's what our topic is today. Spoilers, let me just go ahead and say, this guy's going down. Let's pick up where we left off in Genesis and just go ahead and hit the first part of chapter five and look at one more of our favorite genre in all of scripture, a genealogy. So here we go. This is the written account of Adam's family line. When God created mankind, he made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them. And he named them mankind when they were created. When Adam lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Adam lived a total of 930 years, and then he died. And so, why read here? This is the continuance of the promise given to Eve, that one day, one of her descendants crush would strike the head of the serpent, a fatal wound for this ultimate bad guy who started the narrative of sin and collusion with humanity. And so we follow this. The rest of the Bible in some ways is the unfolding of this family, the genealogy, the, the hopes of every generation. Would this be the one? Would this be the one? Would God's promise come true? And so it hinges here on chapter 5 as an introduction and overture to the rest of the biblical narrative through the continuance of the human family. Who would it be? Let's pause and look at a high hope period where it seems like, oh man, maybe this promise is coming true in our lifetime. Let's turn to the time of David. David has an interesting encounter with a bad guy. You guys are probably very well familiar with this story, the story of David and Goliath. I want to tarry over that story for just a moment to see how the hopes of the defeat of the serpent continue to surface in the biblical narrative. And our hopes are high here. I'm not going to read the whole story, but I want to pause and take a look at a couple of key moments. 1 Samuel 17, starting in verse 4, a champion named Goliath, who is from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. It goes on to describe the ridiculous weight and size of his armor. This was a big dude. Uh, at this time, Israel was having skirmishes with the Philistine nation, and here was one. They lined up. This guy is probably around 10 feet tall. and. He's wearing armor that is really a fascinating description. It says scale armor. This is not a typical description of armor. It seems like the narrative is pointing us to something. Commentators have noticed a connection here between the scale armor and the serpentine imagery of the snake. And so we're invited to see this larger enemy as a stand-in, a representative, an ambassador for Satan. And what unfolds even gives us more clues as to our read of that. All throughout the biblical narrative, you, you hear this, this struggle between right and wrong, between good and evil, between the forces of darkness and the forces of good that plays out in, in human history. And, and so, as, as we've seen, that, that with Cain, the, the agency of, of Satan kind of takes over and consumes him and someone else. And, and that is this 
challenge that we're talking about. So Pharaoh and, and the king of Babylon and all these other guys that come in and out of the narrative sometimes represent the interests of Satan. So what's going to happen with, with David here? Is he going to be victorious over this agent of the serpent? As the story goes, David threatens to cut off his head and in fact succeeds. Let's read the confrontation. David said to the Philistines, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. <laughs> okay, so the hopes are high. David's going to take this serpentine giant and he's going to sever his head. And that is in fact what happens. As you know, David slings his sling. Fun fact, looking around the other day, this might have been the kind of sling that David used. Maybe a staff sling. It would have been a little more subtle, a little quicker to draw, and it would have given Goliath less time to throw. As you see, he comes up with a stick. That's all that Goliath sees. So it might have been a sling staff. He cuts his head off, right? And so the guy with scale armor, this this bad guy that's really challenging uh, against God and against people and means poorly against them, this ambassador of the serpent, his head is severed. And I'm, I'm hoping that sent shivers down Satan's spine to see this child, this son of Eve, so to speak, take this guy down. And so so we're, we're waiting. Each generation, is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? God's promises are going to come true. And as we know, uh, we have this hope that comes. We know that Jesus is the one this was pointing at. Son of Eve, son of Mary, son of God, God the Son, God becoming flesh and entering the human family tree and showing us what it's like to live as the image of God and as a true human that's dependent on God for everything. And who is God? And, and that is the amazing thing about God's redemptive narrative, that, that even at the beginning where he is telling Eve that this child of hers will defeat the serpent, God's gonna send his own son. We know that Jesus is the one who comes to defeat the serpent. He is the image of God that we're waiting for. He is the son of Eve that our hopes have been set on. And it's God himself in this beautiful, amazing, and 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 just, just overwhelming realization of God's sovereignty, of his salvific intent coming to fruition in Jesus. What an amazing, an amazing, beautiful story. As we've been tracing the story of sin, we've also been tracing the story of salvation, and it leads us to adoration of what Jesus has done. By the end of the biblical narrative, it's not just a giant man ambassador for the serpent. We had this disturbing picture of a dragon that the serpent has has grown in the in, in the heavens and, and 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 I don't know how to timeline all of this but we're going to dip into uh, a different genre of scripture and one that I think some of us get a little a little more confused than we need to this is called apocalyptic literature it's designed to give a, a view of the heavenly reality of what's happening on earth. And so sometimes apocalyptic genres are read as future predictions that will happen as vividly as described. That genre is is, is less a description of, of what will happen as it is listed. And it's more of a heavenly um, kind of uh, uh, spiritual view of the cosmic struggle that's happening even within human history. And so uh, with that, we're going to go to John of Patmos in Revelation. Let me read this. In chapter 12, now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they were defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb. 
speaking by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives, even unto death. Rejoice then, O heaven, and you that dwell therein. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. So what's happening here? Is this depicting something that happened that, that put the serpent on the earth? Or is this happening during the life of Christ? What we do know is that Christ in his blood is this victory. It's this decisive point in the moment of this struggle. It is quite terrifying that what started as this kind of innocuous serpent in the garden who's a little sketchy turns into this, by the end of the biblical narrative, the the picture is this great dragon. And, and in some way, this is absolutely terrifying. But what was the decisive point? What was the point of, of, of shift in the struggle? And it comes down to Christ and his blood and his sacrifice and the testimony that we're speaking of right now, that this is a losing battle for the serpent. Guys, if you study World War II history, you know the idea of V-Day and D-Day. And, 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 and D-Day was, a, was a, a decisive moment where the tide shifted towards the victory of the Allied uh, opponents over Nazi Germany. And at this point, uh, the, 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 the battle shifted. It was a decisive battle, but the war still was around. There were still battles to be won. And then V-Day, it was the ultimate uh, cease of, of, of action and, and, and things, things were resolved completely. As Christians, we're kind of invited to see uh, the struggle with sin as a similar reality, that there is this decisive moment of, of the tide shifting, and there will be a resolution, a final victory. It gets us into the idea of what we call inaugurated eschatology, and I don't want to dive into that too much here other than what I've already referenced. There's a great Devo video on this on our Youth Connected playlist. It's called Inaugurated Eschatology, and it was part of our Eschatology 101 series, so you can find that here on this YouTube channel. Maybe this cosmic view of this struggle is, is a little overwhelming. Let's go, guys. We see the same thing in the Gospels. Let's look at Luke chapter 10. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions to overcome all the power of the enemy, nothing will harm you. Guys, this is an exchange between Jesus and the disciples who come back from this missions effort. And Jesus is saying that he saw Satan fall from the sky. So whatever the heavenly struggle is that we get this picture of with Revelation, that we get this picture of here from Jesus, the tides are, are shifting and they're shifting around Jesus. And I, I, I want us to hold on to this hope in this war against sin and our exploration of the doctrine of the unfolding of sin that we also see the refolding of it, the defeat of it, the, the final and decisive moment is on the horizon and the serpent will be ultimately defeated. He's been thrown down and his head will be severed. I believe that. I believe Christ has done that. I believe that our war against sin is not one of loss and, and, and of defeat. The defeat belongs to the dragon. The victory belongs to Christ. And we, as we've explored this idea of sanctification, we know that there is victory for us if we would walk in our relationship with Christ. We believe that Christ will change our nature, that that, that compromised nature, that sin, that the corruption of our, of our minds, our imagination, of our hearts, of our intent, of our will, of our desires, all of that corruption is going to be dealt with as we walk and as we learn, as we put on Christ, as we are sanctified. And God isn't ignoring the one, the agent who brought us into sin, who invited us into it, who colluded with us to bring about his kind of twisted kingdom, the serpent, the deceiver, the accuser, the dragon. He's being defeated. So guys, as we understand our doctrine of sin, as we've watched it unfold in the biblical narrative, we need to keep this in mind and cloak our imaginations, our, our hearts, believe it, that this struggle it's finite. It has an endpoint. And we are walking and learning to put on the victory of Christ. So take heart, take hope. Death and all of his friends have not had the final word. They will and have been defeated. 
we can step into the victory of Christ as we await the final decisive moment, the coming of the new heavens and the new earth and the defeat of the dragon. It's going to happen. So take heart, take hope, and let's wage well this war together as Christ did it. Let's walk in his footsteps. That's how this battle's fought, through the cruciform life, through living like Jesus. So let's pick up our cross and let's put on our victory and let's await the V-Day. Kingdom come. Godspeed. Across the wide Missouri, across the wide Missouri, across the wide.